So the name of this program, well, this is the uh, this is the MS Advocacy Hub, okay? And we're here today with George Pepper. He's the CEO of Shift. MS. And my name is Stuart Schlossman, and our sponsors for today's program are Bristol Myers Squibb, Sanofi Genzyme, and Biogen. And let's give them a virtual round of applause. Thank you. Yay, yay, yay. All right. And here we are. It is February 25th. It is a greatly different time zone. We have we have George Pepper here, the CEO of Shift.ms in the United Kingdom, the social network for people with multiple sclerosis, founded by MSers for MSers. Uh, the charity supports many thousands of recently diagnosed people across the world as they make sense of their MS. It's independent and it's free. The website Shift.ms launched in 2009 following George's own experience of coming to terms with multiple sclerosis. At the age of just 22, he was diagnosed at a time when George faced with key decisions about relationships, family, and career. George is passionate about the role that we, that we people with MS, um, the, with the condition, can play in the management of healthcare. Shift.ms has over 40,000 members uh, from around the world. And prior to joining Shift.ms as the CEO in 2012, George worked as a marketing agency for eight, e for eight years. George lives in Leeds in the United Kingdom. And, and please, everybody, remember the handout that we have here, all right? We will do more of this as we go forward, okay? And for George, it is uh, approximately 5 p.m. his time, and here I am speaking at 12 p.m. our time from here in sunny central Florida, okay? And sunny and warm today. And uh, I'm, you know, we're, we're doing this. It's an international event. So we have MS Views and News is here in the United States. Again, Shift.MS is over in the United Kingdom. And we're here, and we're going to just be doing some questions and answers with, with George. And the first thing that I want to ask is, what is your personal journey? Tell us about your ties with Shift.MS, and, and I'm going to let you take the lead now. Sure. Well, Stuart, firstly, thank you very much for inviting me along. Um, I believe I'm your first UK guest maybe in first international guest. So I feel very privileged to be invited. So thank you for that. Um, but my my personal MS story um, began back in 2004. Um, I was kind of one year into my first full-time job and I'd had a discomfort in my shoulder, nothing more than a discomfort for about a month. Um, and I wasn't too concerned by it. Um, the, the GP or I think primary, primary, care, primary care professional over in the US um, Give me some ibuprofen just to help with the discomfort. Um, but then we realized about a month later when I had optoneuritis, just kind of suddenly one day, I had blurred vision, I had difficulty kind of standing up, that it was something more serious. Um, and then after being kind of ultimately rushed to hospital, um, they initially suspected I had meningitis. Um, once that was ruled out, the fear was a brain tumor. I'm sure it's a story that you know, many of our listeners um, have heard before. And yeah, so that was a concern. The hospital didn't have an MRI scan at the time. So that took a couple of days to organize a trip to another hospital. And then I think it was about three or four days um, after the initial kind of symptoms came up, a neurologist came into my room where I was an inpatient at the hospital and told me that I, it was good news. I didn't have a brain tumor, um, but I've got a probable diagnosis of MS. So that's kind of where it all started. I was obviously delighted to hear the news that I hadn't got a brain tumor because that was the fear. Um, and it took me a while to realize, okay, what is this other condition? I kind of heard of MS, but didn't really know what it, what it was. Um, and we had a conversation. Um, I had a conversation with a neurologist and he firstly said, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not an MS specialist, um, so you need to speak to one of those. Um, but MS is most commonly diagnosed when you're in your 20s and 30s, and you might not have another relapse for 10 years. So that's kind of how it all began. Um, and I, you know, I didn't know what to think back then. I was kind of in that complete moment of shock. Um, but what quickly seemed to kind of unravel over the coming months was that it was, I wasn't going to be one of those people who didn't relapse another 10 years, because within a few weeks, new symptoms were emerging. And I think in that first 18 months, I'd had, I think, seven relapses with a, you know, a different cocktail of symptoms each time. 
So there was optineuritis, there was slurred speech, there was difficulty swallowing. I kind of got to go down my body to remember them. Um, there was kind of issues with dexterity, um, weird sensations that I'm sure most MSs can relate to, you know, problems with my balance and walking. Um, and then the kind of the two which are very much with me now were fatigue. And at times it's been debilitating, but thankfully not quite so bad these days. And then the one I kind of typically forget is the cognitive issues um, as well. So yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot going on then, and it was just it felt relentless that first 18 months or so. Um, but yeah, I was within I think four months. I started on a DMT, um, so I started on an injectable back then. This is now early 2005. There weren't many options about at that time. Um, mm. But yeah, within that first couple of years, it it did feel relentless. Um, but that I suppose the the positive that came out of that. Um, this kind of you know, repeat relapses was that it informed my kind of proactive approach to managing my MS that I've had ever since. So I suppose it it showed me how bad MS can be that, that first year or two, and since then I've I've been determined to not you know to, to get myself in the best position to not return to those kind of those early days. But but Stuart, hey. how was your MS? How did it manifest itself with you? Oh my gosh, a long time ago. I think you weren't even born yet. No. Um, first off, how old are you? I forgot what you said earlier. I'm, uh, I said it very quietly, I think. I'm 38. 38, my gosh. And yeah, that was like, uh, I was diagnosed when I was 39. In fact, it was just uh, one month before my 40th birthday. And and I, I was telling you a weird story, and I've told this to a lot of people. You know, when I was a little kid, I used to have nightmares about dying when I was 40 years old of a heart attack. So when I was diagnosed right before my 40th birthday and and uh, and they told me I had MS, it was a lifesaver for me. I, I wasn't going to die when I was 40 years old. I wasn't going to have a heart attack. I have MS instead. I feel so great. No, um, actually, um, I had multiple years, multiple years going back to when I was a child of many, many symptoms. It was never thought it was never even approached that I had multiple sclerosis. As a child, they thought I had celiac. Um, and that's going back to when I was five years old. I always had bladder issues. I always had vertigo, but never did anybody call it vertigo. They called it nausea. Um, I couldn't go on rides. I couldn't go on amusement rides because I would, you know, feel horrible afterwards. Um, as a teenager, um, I, my memory was terrible. I could be given a, a, a test in school, uh, one of the quickie tests that they have, you know, 20 minutes into the, into the class and, and I failed every test because I couldn't remember what happened the first 15 minutes of the class. Um, my left hand always had numbness and tingling. And um, and I was always told I had carpal tunnel syndrome and I'm going to need surgery and they're going to have to cut my ligaments and, and whatever. Unfortunately, I never did that. Um, you know, there was a multiple of things. Um, when I was a kid, I loved playing sports, yet my legs didn't want to go as fast as my mind wanted them to get somewhere. And so I was always falling down. And, um, you know, it was falling for me was just part of living. And uh, so these days, even if I fall now, you get right back up again because it's part of living. So um, you make it happen. Yeah, of course. And, and when you look back at the time prior to diagnosis, is there a moment when you thought you can now think, yeah, I had a mess back then? Um, yes. So, you know, looking at a lot of the records after I was diagnosed, by the way, I'm interviewing you, not the other oh, way sorry. around. <laughs> it sounds not like that right now. Okay. No, I'm just joking about it. Right. But, uh, um, when I, after I was diagnosed, we looked into a lot of the records of what my mother saved of everything from when I was a child, from when I was diagnosed. And we actually looked back into all these records. And, and again, it goes, it shows me having symptoms of multiple sclerosis going back to when I was five years old. And so the doctors feel that I probably had MS from such an early age and yet not being diagnosed until I was just before my 40th birthday. Yeah, there, not much could have been done. Like, as you said, there was no medications. In fact, when I was diagnosed at that time, there were only three medications on the market. It was Betaceron, it was um, the, uh, the Avonex and the Copaxone, and that's it. And um, and when I was diagnosed, 
and I was put on to the first treatment. They asked me to do beta seron and I was still traveling out of the country for business. So I didn't want to get sick when I was in Nicaragua or Honduras or somewhere like that. So I spoke to the doctor and we decided we'll do something for me that's once a week and it became the Avonex. And uh, so I was home every weekend. So we did that. But uh, continuing on with me and then we're going to get back to you for sure. OK, sure. is that. Um, I, I don't know, nine months in, I was still having a lot of relapses. So they put me on a combo therapy of Copaxone and Avonex. All right. And so I was always aggressive with my treatments. And we'll find out later on during this talk that you and I already began, but maybe others will hear about it at that time, too. So let's go back to you, though. All right. How did you get involved with SHIFT? I mean, where did this come about? You were diagnosed and and then what? Tell us from there, please. Yeah, so the, the first couple of years, just felt like it was almost firefighting. You know, new symptoms were coming up, and I was dealing with those symptoms, trying to get my strength back, or you know, we getting my kind of dexterity, whatever the challenge was at that time. And so, so they didn't really f feel like there was much time to look, you know, outside. Um, but I would say after, you know, a couple of years of living with MS, I was ready to speak to people who were in a similar situation to me. Um, and you know, this is if, this is back in 2005, 2006. Um, and the kind of online communities back then were very different to, to what they are now. Um, and I, I was just amazed about how, you know, despite being told that MS is most commonly diagnosed in your 20s and 30s, I found it really difficult to find people of a similar age. And there were online communities out there for people with MS. But I quickly discovered, you know, from, from entering those conversations that, the, that these people had different challenges, the ones I was going through. They were, and, they were dealing with you know, some kind of severe symptoms, progression perhaps, and I was more trying to figure out what this diagnosis might mean to me. Um, and there was, you know, I did quite a lot of looking around, speaking to other people with MS, realizing they had this similar sort of challenges themselves, and realizing that there, there seemed to be this kind of gap in the market, if you like, so it sounds very commercial. Um, but that was kind of the founding ideas for you know, what has become Shift MS, which was really about creating a kind of a, a safe space where people with MS could support each other that was focused on the recently diagnosed. And so you know, to cut you, sorry to cut you off for a second, but sure. one of the things based on something that you just said, and as I mentioned to you before, I, I only learned a lot about shift MS this week and, and the week prior. But what I learned is that for all the people that are on social media and ch chatting with each other and it being so well-known and public on there and people though are afraid of you know being hacked being spammed and whatnot by being on facebook using shift ms i think is a lot safer avenue for people to communicate with each other how does that work yeah we felt so too i mean facebook has of course evolved a lot over the last 10 15 years um but, but when when we were looking at creating shift ms we 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 knew, and I, I knew from my own personal experience, that you know, when you're diagnosed with MS, there is, there, there can be a real desire to control how you share that diagnosis. So I know from my, you know, when I look back at my own life um, and how I shared that news, is I had, I suppose in a way, being told you have MS, so much control is taken away from you, and there's you know, so much uncertainty is kind of piled upon, and your future looks very uncertain, and there's very few things you can control, and I. I felt pretty early on that once you start telling people you have a mess, you can't put kind of the rabbit back in its hat. You know that it's, it's got a there's, there's no way of then to taking that that information back. Right. Um, so I, I was very cautious with telling people. Um, so much so I, I remember early on I had you know, quite a lot of obstinate neuritis, and one of the ways I found of dealing with it was to wear an eye patch because my eyes were both working fine, but they weren't aligned. So it was just blurred vision, and by it didn't matter which eye I was covering, but it would alleviate the problem of blurred vision. Um, and so I often was wearing an eye patch when I was out and about. Um, and I remember I, I, one day I was wearing an eye patch, I had a, had a stick, and I remember being in a taxi. And the taxi driver asked me, you know, what was what was wrong with me? Typical kind of taxi taxi conversation. And I I remember the ridiculous story I came up with for explaining my injuries. Um, and it was all because I just didn't. Perhaps it's part of just denial. I don't know, kind of those seven steps of acceptance. Um, but I wasn't. I didn't want to share. 
I wasn't ready to kind of be open about my diagnosis. And I think that kind of falls follows through to why we early on we felt that people's MS and talking about their MS didn't necessarily belong on Facebook. And we felt that there's a you know, solid reasons why we should keep it separate. And that's why Shift.MS was launched back in 2009 as its own website. And you know, we had we had pretty moderate ambitions for Shift on Mass back then. And sure. I'm, not, I'm not afraid to admit we didn't have that kind of long-term business plan that wasn't in place. Essentially, it was there for selfish reasons. I, I wanted to speak to people like me. So that's one thing I, I felt I could benefit from. And I'm also aware it was probably my way of dealing with the diagnosis as well. It's something positive to come out of my diagnosis. And it'd be interesting to hear if, you, if any of that resonates with you. Um, so when we started, you know, there was no ambitions for it to be, become my job. There was no ambitions to become anyone's job, but we quickly realized as the community grew um, that we were on to something. And although it was very UK focused at the time, um, the internet being the way it is, MSs were joining up from all around the world. And right. that's, that's continued ever since. So, so tell me, where's your biggest audience located? Uh, um, I'm sure you have uh, demographics on on your uh, the people that are signed up at your site. Can you tell me if, obviously I would think that the United Kingdom is your biggest area, but what comes after that? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting over time, the proportion from the UK has, you know, continues to reduce. And now of our traffic, about 40% is UK, with about 60% international. Um, and to answer your question, US and UK are both about even at the moment in terms of traffic. Wow. Yeah. Um, and the US has just been kind of on an upward curve um, over the last couple of years. And so we see a you know, huge opportunity in all the English speaking countries initially. And in longer term, you know, we're, we're, we're open to translation options and you know, being able to deliver a service to, you know, to Europe, to Asia, South America, et cetera. Sure, sure. In fact, I was going to ask about that. If, um, if you're, do your, people engage in conversations going on like into the Middle East and Asia, Southeast Asia and, and beyond, or is it all basically in, um, is it all basically in English only? So, so, so the, the discussions are nearly all English only, um, but that's, but our traffic shows that, you know, that we have quite a high proportion, about 10% from, from mainland Europe. So I mean, we know now, you know, the browser I use, if I'm on it on a, um, a non-English website, they'll just ask me if I want it automatically translated. So now it's just quite easy to be able to navigate and websites in different language. And we see from our, our site use that people from different languages are both consuming the content, but also adding their own content. So I imagine that's a mix of people who have you know, a decent level of English um, understanding themselves, but also you know un are, are willing to translate because they see the benefit of speaking to a, a large community of people who understand. And that's really sure. what Shift MS is fundamentally about. It's about speaking to people who, who get it, who understand what you're going through. And sometimes okay, that's about giving you kind of support around a specific symptom. Sometimes it's about talking about, you know, things that are unrelated to MS, but just being with people who, who get what you're going through. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Now, before I ask you the next question, I want to let people know who are watching this. If you have any questions for us, on the top right of your screen, there's a orange box with an arrow. If you click on that, you can type in your questions, all right? And then I will ask them later on. Or I might ask them if it's relating to something that we're talking about at the moment, then I'll try to see it in a, and, and ask it at that moment. Okay, otherwise it'll just be asked later on. So um, again, though, if you, I do have a habit of saying people's first names. I cannot imagine anybody not wanting me to say their first name because I'm sure there are a lot of Jennifers in this world. So if a Jennifer had a question, I'm not saying your last name, I'm just saying your first name, okay? And we'll take it from there. All right, but now getting back to things. Shift MS, firstly, how did you come up with the name? How'd you come up with the concept other than you wanted people to find a place to talk with each other? Can you tell us a little bit more about the background? Sure. So I think it, it starts us realizing that there's possibly this niche there for people who are going through diagnosis, realizing that the challenges at that time are very different to the challenges you might be facing when you've lived with MS for 30 yeah, years. So, so, so we recognize kind of that, that need. Um, from there, 
um, we, we looked at other services. We spoke to other you know, existing MS charities in the UK, mm-hmm. and we shared our, our plans for Shift MS. And one of the kind of bits of feedback we got very early on before we launched was they, they got it. They understood that there was this kind of, they understood the gap we were trying to fill, but they, they kind of were very clear about, you know, don't, don't duplicate what's already there. Don't add to the noise that's out there. So we, we took that on board and, and we've kind of very much been a principle of ours ever since. So for us, it's really about, you know, we've always been kind of by MSs, for MSs, which is what we say is, you know, we'd be set up by people living with MS. The content we produce is, comes from our community. So it's really about kind of user generated content that's shared with the community. That's kind of our, our fundamentals, it's by the community. So that's, that's how we, the kind of space came about that is really yeah, it's user generated content. In terms of the name, yeah, I, coming up with names is, is a tough job. Um, we knew first up that we didn't want to be another society or trust or foundation. We wanted to be a kind of entity that appealed, you know, almost creating a brand that appealed to a younger demographic. That was certainly our aim. Um, but the, the starting point actually was the, the ending of our, our name, which is the dot .ms. Um, and I, I remember the conversation very clearly when Freddie, who's co-founder of, of, of Shift.ms, um, said, oh, I bet you there's a, a country somewhere with a dot .ms ending. So we, thankfully, Google was at hand, on hand. And we quickly found out that the island of Montserrat, which is a French-speaking island in the Caribbean, I believe, um, had a domain name, which is dot .ms. And thankfully, many of the names hadn't been taken. So, that was, so we knew we wanted a dot .ms domain name. And Shift really was about, because we didn't want the society, trust, foundation, type of name. Um, we wanted to be something that kind of represented what we believe in. And I, I feel there's a, there's a kind of few meanings by the word shift. And one is when I talk about how I manage my MS, um, it, it's as much as anything, it's about, I, I, I try not to worry about how my MS may progress in the future. I'm aware I live with progressive condition and things you know, are likely to change over time. And when that happens, I will change gear. I'll shift gear. That will that will happen. Right. Um, right. So that that was kind of a, a, a view, kind of a is it mindset I had, you know, within those first couple of years is my way of dealing with the now. Um, and then also, you know, bit, perhaps a bit of post rationalization. But you know, when, when you go into keyboard, the shift key has the kind of an upward arrow. And I suppose we just felt it was it was digital. It was positive. Um, right. it, it seemed to work for us. Great. I want, before I go further again, I, again, you know, I have a habit of interrupting people, but that's what I do, right? Yeah. So um, I, I want to let everybody know that there is a handout here and it talks about shift to met. Well, it doesn't talk about, but it gives you all the different links that you or how you can, you know, get in touch with shift to mess on the different social media platforms and their website. And speaking about your website, my gosh, what a... I, I, I get the tingles thinking about it, right? It, it's an amazing website. It's an amazing website. You got amazing videos on there. Um, it's a very active website. And I was looking at it yesterday, the day before, again this morning. And I just want to ask you, what are some of the key resources and initiatives that Shift MS is now offering to the MS community? Sure. Well, firstly, thank you for saying that. Yeah, it's been evolved considerably over the years. Um, but I think really where our, our site has kind of two key programs that we, we try and deliver. And the, the first is around digital peer support. And this is really around the kind of you know, providing people with MS. So often we hear, and I'm sure you're the same, of the isolation that can happen, you know, so soon after diagnosis. Um, so as much as anything, it's that kind of social support platform. And we do that in both kind of formal and informal ways. So there's the forum where people are encouraged to ask any question about anything that's important to them. Um, and that's a way of speaking to people. And there's ways of finding people um, who are, might be similar to you in terms of diagnosed at a similar time, or maybe they're on the same treatment, or maybe they live in the same location, or perhaps they've got similar interests. So it's you know, up, up to you of, of you know, who, who you're looking for. Um, but then we have what we call the buddy network, which is a far more kind of a formal um, Mm. system where we we put people who are, are recently diagnosed in touch with kind of a more established MSA and that kind of helps them to they connect you know typically over with google hangouts or zoom or whatever their their, their choice of platform is 
and they and they are able to speak to each other with the more experienced ambassador just providing that that kind of counsel almost and that kind of guidance about how to come to terms with your diagnosis, how to, to deal with the challenges that lie ahead. And that's been a real success. And that, that's been launched, I think it started a couple of years ago. Um, but now the numbers have really kind of shot through the roof and it's becoming more international the whole time. So so that is a kind of a one-to-one -one system where we where we we match people together. And then the second program we deliver is what we describe as MSA led. So people with MS leading um, health information. And we typically deliver that through video content. And video content has been something we've been kind of actively producing for, yeah, for a number of years now. I think 2011 was our, our first kind of narrative film. It's a film called Gallop, which I recommend you all to see. Um, but we've produced a number of kind of storytelling films over the years that are aimed really to kind of build a level of empathy with people got a mask, you know, some of the challenges they're going through. Um, we released a, a film, I think, last summer, which, or maybe two years ago now, which is called Sidecar, which was kind of going through the right. challenges of diagnosis, as well as the challenges of progression. And then um, an amazing Canadian filmmaker who lives with a mask himself, a guy called Stash, um, produced a film for us called My Sclerosis, and that was released, I think, last year as well. And that's had a you know, phenomenal amount of views. Um, but we've produced, I don't know, over a dozen or so storytelling films. And many of them are kind of less highly produced and more kind of real life interviews with people with MS um, about some of the issues, you know, whether it's around kind of dealing with symptoms or kind of recognizing and managing relapses. We've got a whole host of video content there. Um, but we've also been doing information kind of interviews over the years. And in the, in the original form, they were called MS reporters which is where we train people who live with a mass to kind of become citizen journalists and we'd pair them up with kind of inverted commas experts. So that'd be, you know, whether it's neurologists or nurses or other healthcare professionals, or perhaps even people who've lived with a mass for a number of years and have kind of have that lived experience to share. And those films have now been, all those videos have been watched now I think over 2 million times. Um, we have, yeah, so we, We've been supported by the Wellcome Trust for a number of years in producing those films. And the Wellcome Trust, for people who don't know, is a UK-based um, charitable trust who are the kind of largest charitable givers in the UK, um, and you know, typically around kind of biomedical biomedical science um, and the kind of public engagement of biomedical science. So we've been very grateful to have that support, um, and we've had so much um, interest in this format being kind of scaled out to other conditions but re recently we named it lived health so we now have a, a separate entity to shift our mass called lived health where we're now working in ms as well as um long covid and we're looking to other conditions over the over the coming years great thank you for that i want to let you know that i watched sidecar the other day and then okay. i posted it all over our social medias and i told people that this is one of the best ms movies i've ever watched okay and if you don't wow. believe me go to my social medias and look it up all right um in fact i have a note here too that i had written out the other day about that and to make sure that i tell you about this and i said something to my video producer bill who's in the room you know in the studio as well and i said you need to see this and i want to know how we could do something similar all right because it is phenomenal all right and i will tell so many people to watch that it's it's great how did you come up with the idea well, so it, it, means, it means a huge amount to hear you say that. Um, and it, you know, for us to create content that people can resonate with, people with MS can resonate with, is, is you know, always our ambition. So to hear you say that is it means a huge amount. Um, I think the background to the idea was, I think everyone who's been diagnosed with MS, I'll, I'll speak from my personal experience from, with the relapsing MS, would I imagine at some point have, you know, considered and, and worried about the fear of um, it, you know, progressing in that condition. I think it's the natural thing for all of us to fear. Um, and so, so we're really keen to, to tackle kind of subjects which are, I think it's quite a taboo subject, to be honest, you know, progression. Um, and it's a, it's a difficult one. It's an awkward one for, for people to have about their, themselves and to have with their family. It's a difficult subject to talk about. And it's a difficult subject often to talk with healthcare professionals about. So we, sure. we felt that that presented a real kind of rich basis for the content. Um, 
And we thankfully we have some really talented people who work on our team, and we're able to work with some you know kind of external consultants who who really got what we're trying to achieve with that film. Um, but it, yeah, it, it it took a lot of it took, you know a lot of resource to to, to get to the, the finished product. Um, and it was it's brilliant to hear your thoughts. It's interesting because it's a bit of a marmite film in a way. Um, I hope my father's not listening because he might not like me saying this. But he said to me quite soon after we launched it, he said, oh, I, I watched your new film. I was like, oh, great. What do you think? He said, oh, I couldn't finish watching it. I was like, okay, well, why not? Crying. He's like, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't watch it. But I, I, didn't, I didn't really know how to, <laughs> to take that conversation, so I just kind of walked away a bit confused. Yeah. But I've actually heard, I've heard a similar thing from a number of people. That it's, it, does, it does kind of tug at the heartstrings because um, it's... You know, progression is a we're all progressing in a way aren't we whether you've got ms or not but it just that fear of in ms it, it just absolutely there's a, there's a focus there on progression um sure. and yeah to, yeah to hear to hear the positive reports means a lot but we realize it's not for everyone so let me cut you off because a few people asked me questions about the movie um yes okay. it is very it is very real i mean it is extremely real and anybody that's an ms patient will definitely feel it, okay? And anybody that's related to an MS patient should definitely feel it. And there's a reason for it, obviously. I mean, that's why you made it. But um, one person is um, asking me where they can see it. Well, go to the shiftms.ms website, okay? Or you can look at our social media pages. It's on there, okay? I put it on all of our pages so you can have access to it. And it will also, it's also on the MS Views and News blog, and it will be within our next newsletter, okay? So we're expecting to see, you know, have a lot of people have access to it, all right? Um, so yeah, and also, also, yeah, going to YouTube and typing in sidecar, should, yeah, mass. should be pretty it'll, easy, it'll right? Yeah. Right. By the way, a person uh, named Jennifer, after I use the name Jennifer as an example, says that she loves the meaning behind the name shift. So I just wanted to make that Thanks, uh, announcement as well, okay? All right, and Thanks. then um, um, Elaine is asking, do you have an area on shift MS for people who don't take any DMTs or cortisone? We deal our symptoms um, by eating healthy and having better lifestyle. So if you can let her know any answer to that, that would be great. Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, but firstly, you know, at Shift RMS, we're not saying, we, 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 you know, we're very much aren't a top-down organization. We're not telling people what to do. Um, the forum is open for people to ask questions about whatever situation they're in. And there are many, you know, there, there are a number of people on our site who, for whatever reason, and some very similar to what you just shared there, um, decide not to take treatment. So you're absolutely welcome to the site and we encourage people to talk openly. And I suppose it's just whether you're on treatment or not, it's just we, we want people to come up with their own their own mind of what you know what the right decision for them is. But you yeah, absolutely recognize that it's an individual decision. Okay. Um, next um, question. Um, you said that shift.ms is a nonprofit. Can I ask how you get your funding to do what you do? Of course. Yeah, so and that's changed over time, unsurprisingly, as we've as we've grown. Um, but we kind of have four four different income streams. So our first is kind of the more traditional charity income stream, or certainly tr um, traditional in the UK, which is where it comes from individual giving. So you know, people who use the site or their families and friends um, mm -hmm. donating, which is you know fantastic for us, and also people doing you know raising money from running marathons or doing their own events or whatever it might be. So that's, that's kind of one space is the kind of community fundraising. The second space is we apply to, to, to large trusts for, for funding, and that might be you know, the likes of the Wellcome Trust or I'm trying to think of international examples. Um, and there's, there's kind of the National Lottery in the UK. Um, there's smaller family trusts, but essentially charitable giving in the UK. So that's a lot of grant writing. And the third would be commercial funding. So I noticed that this episode is sponsored by, I think, I think three funders. Um, right. So you're yeah, reaching out to some of the kind of industry partners for their support um, is a third angle. And then a fourth is what we call earned income. And this is where Shift.ms delivers services for you know, different entities, whether commercial entities or 
the NHS, you know, in the UK, and um, we delivered services. And really, Shift.ms is a registered charity, but we don't see ourselves as a charity. You know, we, we kind of have a startup mindset. And in many ways, you know, my background is I, I worked in a marketing agency for about eight years. And Freddie, who, who's a co-founder, he, he's, he's a designer. And it was almost set up as a kind of creative agency. And that's how the, our teams developed. So we're able to offer services to, you know, to, to clients. Um, and that brings in our kind of our fourth income stream of earned income. Okay, great. So you don't do, do you do, you, do, you do like your own? fundraiser events like a, a ball or a gala or anything like that, bolathon, things of that nature? Yeah, so, so we do very little. Like we organize ourselves. Um, we have you know, members of our community will we'll do similar things. They'll also come to us and say, oh, can we, um, this this ball that's happening, can we raise money for shift? And we, of course, say, we'd, we'd love you sure. to. Um, sure. But we're, we're not necessarily proactive in that sense. Uh, we recognise in in the UK there's other MS charities who kind of occupy that space. Um, so yeah, we we offer individual giving as a not way of people supporting us, but we have moved away from kind of buying places in marathons. And really, it's over to you know, members of our community to decide how they raise money for us if they want. So I have a great idea. So post COVID, when I can get to the United Kingdom, we're going to have a croquet tournament. Okay. You and uh -huh. I, I know you that, said yeah. you're going to kick my butt on that. I know I, I, you already told Probably. me you're going to kick my butt, but yeah. I'm going to give it a good spin for you. All right. I shoot pool really well. So we could play okay. billiards. All right. We'll play over a few pints over there and, and, uh, and we'll make it a good tournament. Okay. I look forward to that. And earlier you mentioned about, um, can give, give me advice about producing a film like Sidecar. I mean, I, I think there's real opportunity for you know, entities like MS Views and News and Shift.ms to you know, collaborate. And you know, we're, we're different size Atlantic, but really, you know, whether you have MS in the US, in the UK, or That's you know, right. any other country, many of the challenges are the same. So yes. if there's ways we can collaborate together, then yeah, we'd love to. Yeah, we'll teach you how to, well, I'm in South Florida, so we'll teach you how to keep warmer so you don't have to let the cold affect you, okay? <laughs> And uh, I just joking around about yeah. that. A bit, of, a bit of sunshine right. would be nice. Yeah, a little bit of sunshine. You do, guys. You guys need the vitamin D. That's what we have over you is you don't have vitamin. You don't have a good natural source of vitamin D over there. No, do you, I, do, I, you, do you find that the vitamin D levels of people with MS in the United Kingdom are very low? Yes. So there's there's different views on this on, you know, it's kind of causation you know, what the different theories are why that's the case um one thing's for sure is i i take um supplements every day as do sure. my children and my my wife was on kind of double doses when she was pregnant um all following kind of advice that's out there um but yeah i think it's important i think for countries you know further away from the equator certainly to take supplements in the in the in the winter i'm not giving medical advice i'm just sharing what what my approach exactly is. exactly yeah. Exactly. Just so you know, I also take um, vitamin D every single day. I take 5,000 uh, international units per day. We're speaking internationally, so I'll say yeah. that instead of I use. But yeah, I take quite a bit of that. Um, and, um, and, and, and even though I live in a sunshine state, it doesn't always work. So you do need supplements too. Yeah. And I, I don't know, I don't know how much benefit will do, but it's a, it's a tiny little tablet to take every day. So I don't, I don't see any reason not to take it. Sure, sure. What are your constituents or what are those that use Shift MS? I'm breaking away from what we were just talking about. Sure. But what are the, the, the people that are using your virtual platform? What do they tell you? Do they, do they, what kind of kudos are they coming back and giving to you? Or what are they saying that might be better to build upon? Yes, yeah, sure. So. And I think the benefits that people take from the service are, are firstly, it's a, it's about you know realizing that they're not alone. There's there's people they can connect with, people who understand what they're going through. So that's a it's a it's a big part, and I think that's something that I personally struggled with early on was that kind of feeling of isolation, that, that immediate separation. That I think many of us feel when you're when you're diagnosed with MS from your your own network. Cause it's like oh, I've got MS, they don't. And it's very difficult for people to understand the mass who don't live with it. Um, so that, that's that's part of it. But really, as as time has gone on, it's you know, we 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 try and support people through the you know 
the challenges of, of a, being given a diagnosis, often the trauma that can come from a diagnosis, um, all with the aim for them to kind of almost accept, come to terms with their diagnosis as soon as possible. And there was a lot of the resources we create are so people can make kind of early proactive decisions about their about their MS. And that might mean, as, as one of your um, one of the listeners, one of the questions earlier said about people kind of making lifestyle decisions, it might mean um, making decisions to, to go on treatment early. But what we believe is that the earlier MSs can be informed about their condition, the earlier position they can be in making you know positive decisions. And that I think all the evidence now it shows that that early time from diagnosis, the earlier you can make those positive decisions, makes a difference to your long-term outcomes. Great, 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 great. Tell me about caregiver support, or I don't know what you call it in the United Kingdom, but is it care partner, caregiver? And do you have chat pages for them as well? So it's a really good question. Um, and it's something we've kind of trialed different things over the past. Um, so in terms of the naming, I think even in the UK, we use the terms you've mentioned and sure. support partners and various different. But yeah, I, I you know, I, I talked to my wife or my wife talks to me about this quite a fair bit in terms of, you know, I often joke that I'm the one who lives the mess. I'm the one who kind of gets all the glory sure. from others. But it, but someone who's living with a person of the mess, often it's, it's really difficult for them um, because they don't get the glory, they don't get the support. Um, and they have many of the challenges that you have as well. So right. we do have, a, you know, an, a, a decent portion of our members on Shift.ms are kind of the, the carer support partners. Um, but we recognise we can do that better as well. And, you know, we're exploring setting up pages where, which are private to only the carers. So they can talk openly about the challenges that they have. Because I'm sure living with me, they must think, or my wife must think, what a pain in the ass a lot of the time. So to be, for her to be able to talk openly about what she's going through, I think is as important as me, me to be able to talk openly about perhaps some of the more sensitive symptoms that I'm going through. Sure. So we um, thank you for those answers, by the way, and thank you for all that you are doing. I mean, I don't want to forget that part either, but uh, I think it's, it's awesome what Shift.ms is doing. So... Um, at many of our, when we were doing our live in-person programs pre-COVID, I used to bring up many times at our events, whether they were small or large, asking all the caregivers or the care partners in the room to raise a hand, asking them to stand and giving them a round of applause for what they do, because they too need to be recognized for for living, you know, living the life of multiple sclerosis, and um, and you know, it's all part of them as well. So. Uh, you know, it's something to think about going forward. Maybe you can make a sidecar care partner program in the future, you know, some kind of great movie based on the care partner. So, right. yeah. And actually, actually, the, the film I mentioned at the start of the, the show, um, Gallup, which is also on YouTube, um, that is centered around a kind of relationship between someone who's going through diagnosis and their care partner or you know, just, just their girlfriend. Um but it's it's interesting. It kind of cuts on some of those kind of sensitive issues, and I suppose that's that's a challenge that many many MSs face. Is you know when your when your partner kind of goes from being your girlfriend, your wife, your husband, boyfriend, whatever they may be, into becoming a carer, and that's that's a very sensitive area. And again, I think there's it is ripe for content. Um, I think it's it'd be yeah. I think that's high up on our list. Perhaps it's something we could do together. Yeah, probably yes. So for everybody in the United States watching this, Akara, C A R E R, is a care partner or a caregiver. And I just want to, you know, give that translation because because uh, George has said it here, and and I I want you to understand what he was just saying. Okay. <laughs> Amazing. It's just yeah, it's, titles. Yeah, it is. Um. All right. So Elaine, back to Elaine. She's asking the question: Does your UK health insurance cover or pay for vitamin d and also what are the deficiency levels well you did say that already the deficiency levels elaine i think for vitamin d is the same no matter where you are in the world so if you're under i think it's uh 50 that you need an increase in your vitamin d levels is that the same do you guys see the same over there yeah i i, I believe so um and one, one thing in the uk is you can go to your what we call you know, general practitioner and ask them to sure. have your vitamin D levels checked. Um, that's quite sure. a standard question to ask. Sure. But yeah, to answer the insurance question, 
And firstly, US insurance and UK insurance, health insurance are two totally different things. Um, but I certainly don't get my vitamin D covered by my health insurance. Um, I actually get nothing for my MS covered by my health insurance. They're, they're very generous at that first point of diagnosis. But I think within six months, nothing's covered for me. A okay. So thank you for that. By the way, um, our health coverage here in the United States does not cover supplements. So uh, we could get rid of that topic right now. But let's talk about let's talk about your insurance for a moment, though. You told me earlier that you um, were a patient of Lemtrada, correct? And um, yes. how did you pay for your Lemtrada then? Was it covered by the um, I don't know what I don't, tell us. I don't know even what to uh, what to say about United Kingdom, so. Yeah, so so I've, I've been on six different disease modifying treatments for my MS over the years, um, and in the UK, we're I think we we recognise that we're very fortunate in that treatments are paid for by our healthcare system. So it's the NHS who are, which is our national health service, um, cover the, those costs. So there's been no direct cost to me as the patient for those. For those treatments um so it's a very different model to the us um and I, I i appreciate the challenges in the us depending on the insurance that you have influences the access to treatments that you might have um but in the uk it typically doesn't the financial side is almost taken away um in terms of the access so my most recent treatment is lemtrada and i had the first dose i think in 2015 the second dose in 2016, and that was all covered by our health system. Is everybody covered then that um, that has MS in the United Kingdom, or are there divisions based on your income? So I, I believe the treatment's licensed by by NICE, which is the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. I, I, I don't know what it is, um, but there's the kind of system that approves treatments in the UK. So it's kind of our equivalent of the FDA in the US, um, and you know, Nice will agree, will agree directly with um, the different drugs companies for the, for the reimbursement, and sure. that's yeah. So, so if, if a drug's approved for use in the NHS, then it will be free to people who um, who live in the UK. Okay, gotcha. Um, all right, next um, we're going to hit on a topic now that we obviously is. Um, obviously is world known, all right? And uh, unfortunately, um, it's happening all over the world. And I wanna to speak to you about the what's happening with COVID-19 in the United Kingdom. Can you please provide us with updates of what's happening there? And, um, and the, well, as you're talking, I'll ask you more questions. Sure. Um, so I think we agreed no religion, no, no politics at the start of the show, but um, it, it, it's, like, it's slightly political in a way. Um, so, yeah, I think it's easy to be um, a critic of much that's happened over the last 12 months. But thankfully, the vaccine program in the UK, the, the rollout of that seems to be going incredibly well, which is very positive. But it's been a it's been a really challenging 12 months, as it has, I imagine, all around the world. Um, uh, we actually had a, a member. I think this was back in March last year, when COVID was, you know, really, it's very, it's becoming very clear of how much an impact COVID is going to have in our lives. And the member um, wrote a post on our forum, and I think it's titled um, "COVID, We've Got This," and it talked, it talked about how um, for people with MS, you know, many of the challenges that COVID brings, we're familiar with. And you know whether that's kind of being stuck in limbo, or whether it's living with uncertainty, or you know having to kind of self-isolate, or you know kind of adapting to different constraints that our respective governments are putting down on us. Um, you know, in a way, many people with MS are familiar with those um, with those challenges. But of course, it, it was a very positive post, and it was you know it's kind of light-hearted, tongue-in-cheek. Um, but really, what the last twelve months has done for I imagine, you know, many MSs in the UK and beyond, is it's it's brought on layers of uncertainty on top of uncertainty. You know, layers of 
anxiety on top of what you, you know, many investors are already going through from an anxiety perspective. Um, I think there's been kind of ups and downs of kind of seemingly good news and then immediately bad news. Um, we call them lockdowns in the UK. I don't know if that's a right. similar term in the US, sure. um, but it seems we're coming out of one lockdown and then we find out two weeks later we're going back into another one. So that's, that's been difficult. Determining our risk as people living with MS. What, what risk do we have from, from COVID? Um, the treatments are on. How does that impact us? You know, we've been kind of finding a way in the dark through a lot of this. Um, and that's been, it's been really difficult for us all. You know, our access to healthcare professionals has you know, significantly changed over the last 12 months. Um, for people going through diagnosis, there have been, there've been delays. People starting or you know, wishing to switch treatment, there have been delays in that as well. And I imagine that these are kind of all similar, similar problems in the US. Um, but it's been a kind of really uncertain time. But thankfully, the, you know, the, the vaccines seem to be a hugely positive step. Um, it seems that you know your what treatment you're on has should have minimal effect to you starting on a vaccine as as soon as you have access to one. So it feels like when there's kind of a really positive moment. But certainly the challenges we've seen through the site. I mean, we we made a, we made decisions early on, and I think it was March last year to kind of refocus our aims as an organisation for the time of the pandemic. So we we've. We realised that isolation would be an issue straight away. Um, so we set up a program called COVID Companion, which is where we paired people living in isolation, and they could discuss, they can they can meet and discuss, um, and speak over video call. And we felt that was important for people who were you know, deciding to that they should stay at home. Um, then we set up a. I mean, throughout the pandemic, we've had regular informational videos. Um, and early on, we were doing releasing videos every week, and these you know, were getting twenty thousand views plus um, in, with interviews between people that mass and healthcare professionals about kind of the emerging research, the emerging news through the COVID pandemic. And kind sure. of the third tranche of our COVID strategy was we're very aware of the significant impacts on people's kind of mental health, and you know we created a, a program called PPE for the mind. So personal protective equipment for the mind. And we, we worked with a number of MSs from our community and a neuropsychologist, and we delivered a podcast series all around essentially for MSs to build resilience on the challenge we're all facing. And really, I think that's resilience is a theme that goes you know, is far broader than the pandemic. And it's what all people with MS, you know, it's, I think it's a, it's a key challenge for all of us to develop our resilience. Because we're aware that you know, MS can be fluctuating for some, it can be aggressive for many and you know, for us to all develop our mental resilience I think it's a, a key aspect and I think the pandemics has kind of just shown a, shown a spotlight on that. Thank you for all that. Now let me ask you a question. I, I don't know and I'm sure most of the people watching this don't know either. How many people approximately live in the United Kingdom? So it's around 65 million I believe. Wow okay that's a lot of people for a little country. So, yeah, so, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty crowded in parts. Yeah, I would say. So, how many people though have they diagnosed with COVID in the United Kingdom? Uh, oh, you're testing me now. How, how many have been diagnosed with COVID? Well, my I, next question is harder, so you got to answer this one. I, I do not know the answer to your first question. Okay. What's how many people? One? How, many, how many people have have passed? Have uh, died from COVID? Yeah, we, we've we've hit some pretty pretty bad milestones over recent times. I was actually kind of reading about the per capita and we're, we're unfortunately, the UK is, is worse than the US on, when it comes really? to population and deaths. It, I think it's fairly close, but, but neither of our countries have come yeah. out of this well. Right, so is, in, the United sad, States, in the United States, as of this past weekend, I believe it was, unfortunately, we reached a milestone of 500,000 people have now passed away or perished from COVID. Um, it's a ridiculous number, a half a million people. I just yeah. didn't know, if, yeah. you know, how that might be with, um, you know, in, in the United Kingdom. Now, um, I think you said 65 million live in the United Kingdom and uh, a tad over 300 million are living in the United States. So I cannot imagine your number being as high, but if it is, that's just horrible. And that's the reason why yeah. you're in lockdown. So, so I, I believe it's around 
and apologies to everyone who's going to correct me, but I think last time I checked, it's around 120,000. Right. So proportionally, unfortunately, sure. it's slightly worse in the UK. Right. Um, right. But neither neither of us have come out of this well, unfortunately. Exactly. So the vaccines uh, have they begun? What kind of rollout do they have going in the United Kingdom? Do you have four meds, three meds that are out there? Can you tell us? I believe there's two that are widely being used now, which are the Pfizer vaccine, which I think we've both taken, which is right. Yeah, is very good news. And then there's the um, AstraZeneca, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, um, which is also being used. And I think there's the is it Moderna? Moderna. Moderna? Yeah. Moderna. Yeah, and then there's, there's there's more to come, but I think it's two okay. currently. Um, yeah. So, um, where's it going there? Um, yeah. So the the vaccine well, that's going amazingly well. So we're now I think we have different tiers for people based on kind of age and kind of you know most at risk, and we we going going down the categories really quickly. Sure. So we're so, we're now kind of around people aged kind of fifty up. Um, I think we've dealt with people with serious conditions, so it's it's very positive. So how did you get it at 38 years old? Here in the United States, you got it at 38. You better be a healthcare worker. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it doesn't work out any other way. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have. I, I was surprised to get the call. Um, it was only lost. I only had it on Saturday, my first jab. Um, but it was, I believe, because I've got MS. So we're now down to people with kind of underlying health conditions. So right, at first right, it was right. people most at risk, um, but sure. underlying health conditions now. Sure. Um, so in the United I, States, in the United States, multiple sclerosis is not a reason to get um, COVID-19. We are not listed as high risk, except in the state of Texas. And I just learned the other day that the state of Texas now has people with multiple sclerosis listed listed as high risk and to be uh, and to be able to get vaccinated earlier than than was first expected. So another question that just came my way is, um, my way for you, is that um, does the United Kingdom offer many resources for people living with multiple sclerosis? Yes, um, I think we're, we're really well supported. Um, there is the MSRT, which is the, the largest of the organizations um, and the most established, and then there's the MS Trust, and both of those entities you know, provide Really, really strong evidence-based information, and although they're UK-focused, I believe both have, you know, kind of fairly decent traffic from um, outside the UK. Um, they have a slightly different focus, whereas the, M the UK MS Trust um, you know, have a lot of support for healthcare professionals, in particular MS nurses, whereas the MS Society has a far kind of broader remit. Um, there's other, uh, you know, kind of smaller MS entities too, but I think we're very well provided in this country. And it kind of goes back to that earlier point about Shift always wishing to avoid duplication. There's some, some really good resources out there that I use personally that you know, many other people with MS use. Um, and so what Shift has tried to provide is something different. You know, we believe in the value of lived experience, you know, hearing from people who kind of you know, walked in your shoes. And that really is kind of the fundamental, um, fundamentally what Shift MS is about. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. And the next one I was going to ask you is with all this isolation going on in the United Kingdom, what is being done for people to, um, well, let's put it this way. What are people doing that will benefit their mental wellness? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's been really tough. Um, you know, we, we I shift our mass, we've developed a number of resources, including the PP for the Mind kind of podcast series I mentioned before. Um, I think it's, there's, a, there's a real attention on mental health right now, which is a positive, um, but it's, it's so difficult. Um, I think you know, we're all encouraged to kind of go out and make sure we leave the house and get fresh air. Um, but in the same in the same um, breath as being told to to not socialise, um, so it, it's difficult. Um, I think you know I, I count myself incredibly fortunate that I I live with my wife. I've got two young daughters. Um, I live in a space where you know, we've got a bit of outdoor space, so I feel very fortunate in that point of view. I, I have a full-time job. Um, so people who who's, who's, you know, perhaps have a different living situation and who don't have outdoor space, who perhaps um, aren't employed as a result of the pandemic, then 
you know, I can't, I can't even imagine what the last 12 months must have been like for them. Um, so it, it is a real challenge. And I suppose anyone who's listening to this, who's, who's having, you know, who's really feeling the strain, then I just encourage you to, to speak to others. And there's many platforms out there, including Shift, where at least, you know, being able to speak to those who kind of get what you're going through is all important. Sure. Thank you for that. I, I should, I should, I should jump in, Stuart, and just say that I've, I've been informed reliably that the UK have passed 4 million cases. Um, really? So I don't know why I'm saying okay. that's a smile on my face. That's, that's, that's just horrifying news. It, it is. It is. Definitely is. Um, okay. Another question for you, and I'm going to be jumping around a little bit right now, is um, how many, going back to your chat groups, getting away from COVID for a minute, going back sure. to your chat groups, how many people do you feel participate daily online? Yeah, it's a good, good question. Um, so in terms of participate daily, yeah. So we have we have about 40,000 members on the Shift.my site. We have around 50,000 followers on social media. Um, so it depends if we're talking about the social media as well as the Shift sites. But on the Shift site, you know, we, we see that there's around kind of 300 to 500 conversations um, different kind of conversation threads a month, um, which have multiple voices. And um, we see from our traffic that there's a, you know, there's around you know a couple of thousand um, visitors, also users, active users on a daily basis. Um, and we, you know, we, we've done various kind of evaluations in the past where we try to monitor the difference, the kind of the impact that MSs are having um, based on whether they're members or whether they're essentially just browsers, people who aren't signed up, and what we've kind of been told repeatedly is the benefit that people get from our service, even those who aren't signed up. So just kind of people reading questions that they have themselves and reading the responses to those brings sure. them a, a great deal of comfort. So we've kind of resisted going behind a, a kind of a, a sign-in wall, if you like. Um, so kind of the content on our forum is available to, to people, whether they're a member or not. Okay, thank you for that. And and do you have any online support groups, or is it just like basic one-on-one -on -one communication? So, what do you mean by online support groups? Because I guess Shift MS is an online support group in itself. What what, we, what do you mean? How many members? How many members can collaborate at a time um, on Shift MS? So, on the forum, as many people yeah. can can be involved in a conversation. As okay. as they wish, there's no there's no limitations there, and we've got active spaces on all the kind of major um, social networks as well where people, you know, discuss MS. So yeah, there's, there's plenty of opportunities for people to join in. Okay, and how do they do they is it connected through just your site or are they using other uh, platforms like a Zoom to get connected? So fundamentally, you visit the Shift.ms website. So it's www .shift dot ms um in the top right you can click the kind of sign in or register button and it's a it's a fairly straightforward um registration process and yeah that, that's the way to actually register on the main shift site but also you can be active on our social media platforms as well so hopefully that process is is quite straightforward and i imagine similar to many other services yeah that's great that's great um in fact um i was you know, I know that we're bouncing around a lot. I'm sorry for that right now, but you know, we have we have a lot of different questions that are being sent my way, and they're coming to me literally from 180 degrees because I have people in the studio that hand me questions as well. So to make sure that I ask of you, so um, so we're just going to bounce around for a little bit again, and we'll go back yeah. to COVID yeah. in a minute. Is there anything else you want to tell me about COVID? Oh, do I want to say about COVID? I mean, I think that there's. Is there anything what, that shifts? Is there anything that um, is is well? Let's put it like this: Do you have a place on your platforms where people can just go on there and and chat with each other about what's going on and and learn about what is available for them by your network? Yeah, they they can do that through the main platform. I mean, I think I think COVID, you know, the last twelve months has shown us quite a few things. Firstly, Shift.ms as a digital platform that's essentially around peer support. You know, we were kind of ideally placed to to be a, to be there for people with MS and continue to 
to be there for people with MS. So I think that's a really positive sign. Um, I think it's been difficult for many of the kind of established charities from a fundraising perspective because, you know, the marathons that uh, many charities rely on just haven't been possible in the same way over the last 12 months. So it's, it's, it's been a really challenging time in the UK, and I expect internationally from a fundraising perspective. But Shift MS is, is doing okay in that regard. Um, but COVID, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, been a, it's been a really challenging time. And I think if, if anything, if, if I'm trying to look at it in positive lights, I imagine the kind of general public have a greater level of empathy towards people with MS, you know, having been enforced isolation themselves, being through these kind of lockdowns. So I think that hopefully there's some positives to people with MS, um, but the negatives and the unknowns are, you know, we're not sure what the healthcare system, what the healthcare systems, you know, in both our countries will look like in the years ahead as a result of the you know, financial crisis. Yeah. Thank you for that. But I have one more question about COVID and then we're going to get back to a couple of other things. Um, of and then and then I think we've been on here a lot of time. So, you know, I, I know you have work to do as well. All right. So in the United States, we have what's called the COVMS registry. Um, it's um, it was something that was put together by the National MS Society, the Consortium of Multiple Sclerosis Centers and quite possibly another MS Society from outside the United States. But I'm not quite sure or I don't remember at this point. My cognition is starting to ha uh, feel this as well today. But um, what kind of registry is available in the United Kingdom for the MS patients that contract COVID? Well, there's a UK MS register, and okay. they've been around for, for some years. And that's, I believe, funded by the UK MS Society, um, but it kind of run independently. And from early on in the pandemic, um, there, the register was adapted to you know, collect data relating directly to COVID. So that's okay. the, the, the UK specific register, but, but I'm aware the registry is internationally, which can do a similar, collecting similar sure. data. Okay. All right, great. Well, thank you for that answer. How is advocacy, how do you describe as advocacy different from activism? How do I describe the difference in advocacy and activism? That's a, that's a, I might throw that question back at you. Um, I'm, not, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I've ever described them differently to each other. Um, it's interesting because I think the term, like when Shift.ms is described as an advocacy platform, um, or I'm kind of introduced as an advocate, it's weird because I, I just, I don't see myself that way, but it's just perhaps it's different language from different countries. But how, I mean, how would you, how would you see the difference? And how would you describe both kind of your role and my role? You know, well, no, I find my role and your role probably pretty much similar that we do advocacy. Um, I think that activism is more political or policy based. Um, that's the way I see it. So um, I don't know if it's true or not. And I don't know if there's a correct answer on this. I'm just reading a question that was sent to me. So um, I, I should have had time to review it before um, asking this of yourself or even trying to get my own mindset involved with this. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be doing some searching after this call, though to find out the difference. Okay. Yeah. Great. You can let me know afterwards, and if it's worthwhile, we'll post it, okay? <laughs> cool. <laughs> All right. Another question. Um, how or why does connecting with – this is a good question. What do you feel is the best – what do you – what can you give me as the best answer why people should connect with others about their MS? Yeah, it, I mean, it is a good question. Um, and I think it would be wrong to say that it's the right thing for everyone. I think we'll, you know, our MS is all different and we'll, you know, individuals. Um, I can talk about my own personal experiences and I found that support, just knowing that there's other people who are going through the same thing I'm going through, that being, you know, hugely helpful. I think the kind of the learning, the coping, I suppose the more, the, the learning strategies that I've developed from seeing how others kind of have reacted to their diagnosis, hugely helpful and in many cases, hugely inspiring. So I, I find my I, I learned so much just observing how other people with MS deal with their diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But really, and I think this is where the question is coming from, perhaps, is our ambitions for you know, the shift MS service is that when people are diagnosed, we're there to, to help them through that kind of the challenging early times of diagnosis with the aim to get them informed, the aim for them to, to manage their condition as soon as possible, with the, with the ultimate aim 
for MS to play a smaller part in their life as possible. So I, I think I agree with the sentiment behind the question, which is, you know, we don't could have got MS, we don't have to speak to MS with people with MS the whole time. I and I do agree with that. Um, but actually knowing you have a community who understand what you're going through can be hugely helpful. Right. So <clears throat> excuse me a minute, I definitely need water. Um you hear that Bill? I need water. Thank you. Um <clears throat> sorry about that. But Not um so and da, da. All right. So when um, when I created MS Views and News, thank you. When I created MS Views and News, it was created because, like what you're saying, people needed a way to connect with each other. Um, when I was first diagnosed, I learned that nobody in the support groups knew why they had MS, and they couldn't get answers, and they couldn't find out anything about their symptoms and what they could do for their symptoms. So being internet savvy at the savvy at the time. I got on the internet and I started looking up what was wrong with myself and bringing it to support group meeting um, and letting people know. And then people at the support group who were afraid of the internet at that time were asking me if I could get information for them. Okay. And that went on and on and on. And then I found that, well, I have their email addresses. So let me look up information for people at night and I'll get it to them and then create like a little article. And um, and I called this Stu's Views and MS News when I first started. And I did not know that. Amazing. Ah, see, so so we began like that, and um, that went out to originally just a group of about 25 people. And uh, and again, you know, it built up, and over time, it went international. And then we found that people were registering from in as many as 90 countries to you know get information that I was providing at that time. And this was before we even really formed the organization that when we created the uh, the organization MS Views and News, I had to get rid of the name Stu's Views and MS News and just keep it as MS Views and News. But, uh, but yeah, it was created so that way people can find out about what they were not getting from the medical community because the medical community simply didn't have time, you know, to providing a one-on-one -on -one with what's going on with you. So... I, I just wanted to compliment and say that what you're doing to shift MS is so, so, so needed. And um, and I'm hoping that, you know, MS Views and News and Shift can collaborate going forward and we'll get information about, you know, Shift's um, chat boards and chat rooms and communications going so that way we can tie things in better together. If I, yeah, absolutely. And I think there's real parallels. So, you know, what about kind of, the program I mentioned earlier, um, which is now called Lived Health MS, and, yeah. and you can find that on YouTube. And that, that is all around informing people. We recognize that in the UK, you're lucky if you see your healthcare professional once every six months. You're fortunate if that's the case. Right. So there's huge, you know, huge periods of time in between, and those meetings, you know, the appointments you have always are so rushed and you know, they never feel long enough. So, really, what Lived Health is trying to, the need that is trying to meet. Is, is to kind of bridge the gap between appointments and provide MSs with you know, absolutely expert expert knowledge. And we find the, the conversation between someone living with MS and a healthcare professional, being able to view that content, um, all produced through videos. Um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a really engaging way to kind of digest the information and it makes it very relatable to have someone who also got the condition speaking to the healthcare professional. So yeah, I think we're kind of meeting the same needs perhaps in slightly different ways, but yeah, it's, I think it's, it's inspiring hearing your story. So thanks for sharing. Great, thank you. And and just to let you know further that, um, you know, MS Views and News, we have our YouTube channel and we have hundreds, if not close to a thousand different videos on there already that are all about multiple sclerosis and, um, we have we do these we do these live um, programs now weekly, and we're doing this month we're doing nine virtual events. Um, but wow. for going going forward through the most of the rest of this year, we'll be doing eight virtual events per month, and hopefully come May or April, I'm going to start doing some live in person programs again as well in select areas around the country, mainly in rural areas, and that's a subject that we didn't even hit upon. But I would like to get back with you in discussing not today but maybe another conversation we could have about ms in rural united kingdom i mean it's yeah. united kingdom for people to know is is great in britain i think it's 
Scotland, Wales, Great Britain, and Northern Ireland? Is that what it is? Yeah, well, in England, Scot Scotland, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Scotland, yeah. England, yeah, sorry, Scotland, England, right. Scotland, England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. So what happened to Southern Ireland? What did they, they do with that country? Well, it, uh, it's, it's very confusing, all the different descriptions of our of our sure. islands. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a discussion for another day, I think. That's that political yeah. stuff, you know. We're staying yeah. away from that. Yeah. Um, so help me, um, tell me what you can tell me about, a little bit more about ShiftMS as far as how best for people to connect with you, and then we're going to wrap things up here. Sure. Well, in terms of accessing the site, then please please visit the site, which is www.shift.ms, um, or visit us using that same name across, you know, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. Um, yeah, you'll find us there. Um, but for us, you know, over the, over the coming years, our our focus is very much on increasing the community. You know, we're about 40,000 members now, but really building our membership in you know, particularly English-speaking countries um, is, is an absolute high priority for us. Um, the, the Buddy Network, which has become our kind of leading program, scaling that up, and you know, we're getting more and more um, users and requests to, to, have, to meet with the Buddy from the US and from you know, different continents. Um, that's, a, that's a key part of our plans. Um, our service, sure. more and more, we're looking to develop a kind of personalized service. So we're only providing information that's relevant to that individual, you know, um, whether that's around their kind of treatment or their location, whatever it might be. And finally, you know, we're, we're launching an app this summer. So there'll be a an app that'll be downloadable from either iOS or Android. And that will be in addition to the website. So there'll be, be many great. different ways to connect with us. That's great. That's great. One thing I do want to say before I say, Thanks to you. I say thank, I've been saying thank you to you the whole, the whole program, right? But, um, we are doing another event tonight. MS Views and News is doing another program tonight. And we are doing this on our, yes, our MS Views now, which we began at the beginning of the pandemic. It is primarily the program about COVID-19. So these are monthly updates that we've had with different MS experts or clinicians speaking about this, um, every single month. And we do have this program tonight. So for anybody that's on here that wants to join in tonight, that would be fabulous. And um, that's at 7 p.m. Eastern time. For you, George, sorry, it's the middle of the night already. Um, you can you can watch it, but it's midnight for you, okay? Um, and uh, we would love to have you on there, though, if you want to hear. Um, we have Dr. Al Jolson Walker from South Carolina on there tonight. And, um, and he'll be providing the newest MS updates going on in the United States. And um, and again, we would love to have you and we'd love to have any, everybody else on here. All right. But uh, George, in your own words now, without any questions coming from me, tell me what you would like us to know. Tell me what I'd like you to know. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, you I was the spot here. Question. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd like to just let, let everyone know first up that we've got fantastic fashion sense of our blue shirts today. You haven't, you haven't you. mentioned it yet. Yeah, um, no, I didn't mention that. No. Um, but I think it's just realizing that I think it's understandable for people with MS to, to feel alone. Um, but there's such an active community out there that you know, there's so much support for you. So, so please don't think that you're on this on this journey alone. Um, and in terms of you know, my, my opinion of how to cope with MS is the sooner after diagnosis, you can become informed, then the, the better that is for your long-term outcomes. And you can make kind of informed, proactive decisions, whether that's about your kind of lifestyle, whether it's about treatment, uh, you know, your exercise regime. I, I really do think that it's everyone who's got a master's responsibility to get informed and be proactive. But we're here for each other, so please don't feel alone. That's right. And, and again, the bottom line is, is communicating with others, all right? Uh, whether you do it by being on these programs, ours or Shift and Masters programs, um, but getting online and speaking with others can help you to resolve something that you're feeling that day, that month or that year. Uh, although I can't remember beyond a week ago, so I try to mm -hmm. stick with the day and the week. And, um, you know, we would love for Mr. George Pepper to come back on here again and speak with us again in the, in the near future. Anything else you want to include? Just please, you know, Please visit the site, shift.ms, have a look at some of our films, 
um, and let us know what you think. But looking forward to seeing you on there. And Stuart, right. thank you so much for the invitation. I feel very privileged to be the first UK UK guest. So thank you very much okay, for watching us. So and again, I'm going to cut you off real quick here, right? What I did not say at the very beginning is George Pepper, CEO of ShiftMS. And so we're going to make sure that everybody does know who I'm speaking with today, okay? Thank you very much. Have Fantastic. a great day. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll speak soon, okay?